Well, thank you very much for inviting me um, to give a, a paper here. I've, I've, I've always enjoyed giving, I think the last paper I gave here was, um, was about uh, the doorway stones at Anna down the disassembled Hiberno Romanesque doorway and, and that, that, that worked really, really well. I enjoyed doing it. I, I haven't been here for ages because of lockdown. I've been watching the, um, the lectures that have been given here um, by Zoom, which, I mean, you know, well done, Paul and Irene, for, for, for managing to achieve that. That was, uh, you know, that was, that, was some, that was some achievement, really. But so um, it's amazing to be back and it's a beautiful day. And um, today I'm going to talk about uh, three Irish saints, uh, Meldon, Versa and Cúana, whose uh, dossiers, whose stories uh, suggest that they founded monasteries within each other's lifetimes in the late 6th to early 7th centuries and within a few miles of each other on the eastern shore of Loch Carib, County Galway. And that, that's kind of interesting when you start to get a cluster like that. What does that mean? Um, these three saints have not really been studied. They certainly haven't been studied um, in, in relation to each other. Uh, they have been studied separately. Um, although St. Cuna gets kind of short shrift in the Dictionary of Irish Saints where um, uh, Professor O'Rean, who put together the Dictionary of Irish Saints, says, um, I, don't, I don't understand why there is a saint's life about the saint, which seems like a kind of a, a slightly mean thing to say. But anyway, so the origins of Fursa and Meldon in particular, and the location of their cult's principal centres have been the, the centre of, uh, or have been the subject of, of quite hot debate between certain scholars, you would think that, you know, uh, the origin of, you know, where, where saints come from in Ireland wouldn't necessarily cause argument between scholars, but it, it, it has done. Um, you know, whether Fursa and Meldon came from Munster, whether they came from Connacht, whether they came from Ulster. Um, and that's because you have uh, different monasteries in, in all three provinces that uh, are dedicated to these saints and possibly saint, different saints with the same name. So uh, it's, it's difficult enough to identify. But today I want to look at the evidence for this cluster of saintly activity in East County Galway and maybe uh, draw some, some observations uh, from this group. In particular, I'll be looking at the second life of Saint Fursa. Uh, which is the only text that recounts his origins in Ireland in any detail, and argue that this text, the second life of St. Fursa, uh, is more authentic than has been supposed before now. Um, this life has very often been considered to be um, a late, uh, uh, late 11th or 12th century um, uh, fiction written in, uh, in France, but uh, for reasons that I will uh, get on to, that can't actually be the case. The material for that life of St. Bertha uh, must come from, from Ireland. And I argue that it comes from here. Um, I'm hoping that this type of exploration of these saints who have been studied, as I say, to, to varying degrees, separate from each other and separate from this shared geopolitical landscape might yield a useful perspective. It's amazing the extent to which um, uh, individual saints' lives get studied out without recourse to their historical context or even their geographical context. And a great deal is lost as a result. Um, so, so even uh, you know, even bringing a, a kind of a knowledge of the, the historical context is can actually turn up pretty um, surprising uh, results. So, only one short life of Saint Meldon exists, um, 
uh, published in 1645 by John Cal Calgan in his Acta Sanctorum Hiberniae. Um, John Calgan was a, an Irish Franciscan on the continent and a counter-reformationist. Uh, and he places Meldon, he's given the, saint, uh, the feast day of the 7th of February. Now, there are uh, several saints in the genealogies and saints lists named Melon or Meldanus, um, who have various feast days. And this is the problem. You, know, you have a great big long list of, of, of people called Meldanus, um, given different feast days, you know, who comes from where and when. But uh, Colgan's text corresponds with the Meldon uh, celebrated on the 7th of February, thus described in the Martyrology of Angus. Melon, great grandson of Con, of Inish Maku Huin on Loch Carib in Connacht. The Vita relates that Meldon was born of the noble and ancient <coughs> stock of Ua Quinn. And while this name is widespread, it's possible that this particular branch refers to the chiefs of the Castle Bar area of Mayo connected with the Ifiocroch. He is Ifiocroch. described as abbot of a famous small monastery on an island in a broad lake called Loch Urbson in the western region of Connacht. Yeah, let's see. So here's our here's here's our uh, here's our lock card. And the lake, as everyone here will know anyway, um, the lake is the road. Uh, that's the thing about you know um, communities that live around the lake. Um, it's it's the lake that is the highway, and 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 people. Uh, uh, communicated with each other and um, uh, sold to each other and bartered with each other and negotiated with each other um, uh, via uh, going by boat uh, on, on the water. Um, so in Chiquin Abbey site, um, accessible today by a causeway in Chiquin, the island of the sons of Urquin, lies at the very northwestern corner of Morshola, what would later become the Barony of Clare. And as you can see, not a, not a great deal. But it's actually, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful little place. I mean, every time you go, you know, you go to the trouble of finding an early Celtic monastic site, Invariably, they pick places which are actually kind of lovely and uplifting, uh, and, and this is, is very much that. Now, having said that, you know, I don't know what it's like in February, which, which is always the, <laughs> the acid test. So there's not, as you can see, very much left there, um, but the books of survey and distribution record that in uh, 1641, the Earl of Clan Rickard owned in Chiquin, on which then still survived, uh, and I quote, an old abbey, an orchard, and a garden plot. So that's actually quite important uh, record because as you can see, you know, there's not much left standing now. The archeological inventory for North County Galway, uh, however, observed in 1999, that faint foundation lines of a building, possibly a church, can be seen at the north east end of the island, close to the shore, rectangular in plan, but no architectural features survive. So, though today the little church appears just to be a heap of stones, um, the field wall surrounding it is very thick and subcircular in shape, in the manner of a monastic enclosure. Uh, field walls. The, the shape of field walls is, is kind of a, um, uh, it's a bit of a giveaway. You know, if the wall is uh, subcircular or circular, and if it's very, very thick, there's likely to have been some activity within, um, within the enclosure. So, Meldon, however, did not found the monastery on Inchiquin. This, 
had already been achieved by his mentor, St. Brendan, the navigator, as the Dublin Latin life of Brendan relates. And in this life, in this vita, Aid Macachat Kirm Karna, King of Connacht, is called King of Connacht. It's probably more accurate to call him a king in Connacht, uh, was accustomed to pasture his horses on Inchiquin. And without permission from the king, he landed on the island, this is Brendan, and built a cell there, and even used the king's horses to draw loads. And the saint's life says that Aid was furious and vowed vengeance and tried to cross the lake to the island, but a storm rose up and raged for three days. And on the third night, God warned Aid in a dream that if he harmed Brendan, he would quickly die. So both the king and the storm calmed down and Aid, making a virtue of necessity, presented both the island and his horses to the saint. Now, Colgan described how Meldon, with his many brothers, joined Brendan's foundation and rose to become its abbot. Brendan's efforts are evident elsewhere in Morshola. The Book of Ballymote and the Annals of Inish Fallon record that Aid Macachet Pirm Karna, the same king who so reluctantly gave Brendan in Shaquin, conferred Anadown on God and St. Brendan around the year 550, only a few miles southeast of the island. While the much more important complex of Anadown clearly eclipsed its neighbor in Shaquin, this house too formed part of the cluster of churches in East Loch Corrib. This is from the, from the other side, you can see the, 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 um, the, sort of the mound of what used to be uh, the monastery more clearly there uh, with the monastic enclosure all around it. And here's the causeway. Which has a passing place and that's for a park. <laughs> Mind you, nothing came out of it. It wasn't exactly stopping anybody from, from, from going to and from the island. So yeah, this house, so Anadown formed uh, part of the cluster of churches in East Loch Corrib. But there is a mystery concerning Brendan's benefactor, this king, Aid Macacic Therm Karna, however. So while this sixth century king is described in the genealogies and the annals as the Ibruan ruler of Mo'i in, in Roscommon, with his seat at Kruachan, the historian F.J. Byrne doubted whether such a king uh, over in Ros Roscommon would have had the power to bestow on Brendan the site for his church at Anadown in Moshola, far to the west and supposedly out, outside of his jurisdiction. How to, therefore, did Aid Macachach come to pasture his horses on Inchiquin? That the Annals of Ulster for 577 record that Aid was assassinated by the Ebruin led Byrne to doubt that he was Ebruin at all. And he concluded that the Ebruin pedigrees show every sign of falsification, having been rewritten later by the Ebruin E who claimed Aid as their ancestor. Indeed, other scholars have wondered if Aid's kingdom in fact lay further west, covering all Shola. Uh, and Morshola, whose principal seat was the Cranog stronghold of Loch Kimme, near the slopes of the sacred hill of Nokma. And if this were so, Aid would certainly be in a position to grant both Inchiquin and Anadan to Brendan. And that's something that um, I want to uh, do some, some work on um, exactly you know, who. Um, where the kingship of the Ibruin started. Um, I have a feeling that uh, Kenneth Nichols came up with this idea, uh, Kenneth Nichols and Cork, that uh, this king was based in Loch and not in, in Roscommon, and, and, and therefore um, that Loch ha has a kind of a, not only a ritual landscape, but a royal landscape as well. 
and these two things, ritual and royal landscapes, increasingly archaeologists are coming to realize that they go hand in hand. Um, and I think Nakma has been rather, the ritual and royal landscape of Nakma has been rather um, uh, uh, sidestepped perhaps by comparison with equivalent at um, in, in, in Auenmacher in Navan Fort in Armagh at Kurchen um, in County Roscommon and in the Boyne Valley and in uh, Tara. Um, I think probably uh, the, the big tumuli, the big um, burial mounds on the top of, of Nokma fit into this uh, list of what royal and ritual landscapes uh, tend to have. Oh, I have a heckler. I was hoped to have a heckler. Cool. Um, so Meldon's life, therefore, praises him. Uh, Colgan's Life of St. Meldon praises him for his remarkable sanctity and miracles in life and for his writings to the devout and intriguingly for drawing the injustice of our times to our knowledge. Um, that's intriguing because I have no idea what that's about. But, but his main claim to fame was that he was the teacher and spiritual advisor of St. Fursa and is described in the Martyrology of Angus as Fursa's soul friend. Fursa was an Irish saint born in the late sixth century who left Ireland around 630. He went to England, he founded a church in East Anglia, and then uh, he journeyed to northeastern Gaul before founding another church at Lagny in, in, in northeastern France. And dying around 650, he was buried at Peron, uh, which became the centre of his cult in France. He was most celebrated for his visions of heaven and hell described in his Vitae, in which his teacher, St. Meldon, appeared with another Joan or Beoannus, possibly Meldon's brother, or possibly a version of St. Brendan's name, uh, to counsel Fursa in his dream vision. And this dream vision of Fursa very, very important in literary terms because it, um, it was the first of uh, a, a type of, 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 of vision poem um, that gave rise to things like Dante's Inferno. Um, and, and I think it probably owed a great deal to the, the vision literature um, that Fursa would have grown up with in Ireland um, and which he, he, he uh, which um, in, in, in the, the vision of Fursa uh, kind of feeds um, the, the sort of the religious view, the, the, the view of heaven and hell, but it has this kind of pre-Christian Irish flavor to it, which, which gives it a, a kind of a, an amazing kind of hybrid feeling and a, and a, and a, 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 a kind of a realism and a, a new, um, it, 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 it really, really became very, very popular on the continent, um, perhaps much more so than in Ireland, um, because it was something very, very new in France, in the Frankish world at the time. So in the Vita Prima, or the first life of St. Fursa, written at Peron soon after his death, um, Meldon and Bjorn are described as of the province in which Fursa was born. Now, I don't want to get drawn into the fray concerning Fursa's origins, but if Brendan founded Inchiquin and Meldon succeeded him as abbot, Meldon whom the martyrologies describe as Fursa's spiritual advisor, then presumably this tells us something about Fursa's origins. And here I'm, 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 I should point out that, um, again, some scholars interpret this very differently. Uh, Porica Rian uh, concludes um, that Meldon, Bjorn and Fursa all originated from Southeast Ulster. Um, there's a um, German scholar, very good scholar called Stephanie Hamann, who, who reckoned that they came from, from Munster. So, um, yeah. 
conclude from that what you will. Um, I, I do think that looking at a historical and place name and uh, archaeological uh, uh, and geopolitical context uh, can tell you things that, that looking at, at the text alone will not tell you. So Colgan recorded that he drew Meldon's life from various sources. This is the, the frustrating thing about John Colgan. There he is in the 17th century saying he, he copied saints, Irish saints' lives from this text and from that text. And of course, with all the wars on the continent, they don't exist anymore, or very often don't exist anymore. And, and that's frustrating. Um, and it's been possible to, uh, it's been possible for me to trace line for line um, Meldon's life from the various sources. The first of Colgan's sources is a life of St. Fursa, printed in 1607 by Jacques Desmay, uh, a doctor of the Sorbonne and a canon of Peron, Peron being uh, the cult center of St. Fursa. For, and Fursa's burial place in northeastern France. So that's what, so early printed book, um, that's what it looks like. Um, and it's written in a kind of French, it's sort of early French, it's kind of nice. Um, uh, I had quite a lot of fun translating uh, um, parts of it. But, um, Colgan accords Desme the highest praise, and uh, Colgan translated this French text into Latin, thanks, and included it in his Acta Sanctorum, Latin being the, the, the lingua franca, we're all supposed to understand Latin. Yeah, actually, it's easier to, to translate French uh, than the Latin, but anyway. But how authoritative is this text? Did Desmond make it up? The editor's preface to Desmond's third edition, dedicated to the canons of the church of saint Fursi de Peron, affords us an important clue that Desme drew his text from an original in the library at Peron, and that's very important. And this information actually accords with the view of a scholar called William Newman Mendel, who um, wrote about Peron. Um, and it had been supposed, Peron was known as a per, Perona Scotorum, Peron of the Irish, because of having been founded by Fursa and because uh, it became a tradition at Peron that um, they copied many Irish books and they had um, Irish born uh, abbots for quite some time. And thought it was believed that Peron was destroyed by the Vikings, the library was destroyed, everything was destroyed and that um, the, the, that the library, that nothing uh, from the library of Peron before the Vikings survived. But Desmay's, uh, Desmay's copy of, uh, uh, of, of material about uh, St. Fursa shows that the Vikings did not destroy Peron in, 18, in 880. Um, as, as recorded in various annals, um, and that the monastery, presumably with its library, survived in some form until its final destruction in 1794 uh, uh, during the French Revolution, well after Desmay's time. So this text is actually quite useful. It, it, it dates to a time uh, before the French Revolution when so many manuscripts were destroyed. Desmay's life includes material not found in any other text, such as uh, Fursa's pilgrimage to Rome uh, with his brothers Foylan and Ulton. Um, Colgan's second source for his life of St. Meldon is the Vita Secunda or second life of St. Fursa, whose early part concerning Fursa's parents, birth and childhood in Western Connor has been the focus of competing views. You're right, I didn't need the bottle of water. <coughs> there was I saying, I don't need water. Yeah. One second. <clears throat> so Colgan says he drew his version of Fursa's second life from a manuscript held at the Cistercian Abbey at Signy, 
Uh, but there are four other manuscripts of this text, one of which in the Vatican has an introductory letter from Arnulf, the abbot of Lagny, the first church in France founded by St. Teresa, addressed to the clergy of Peron, talking about their mutual founder. Um, remember, this is all against the backdrop of scholars uh, insisting that Peron had nothing to do with Connacht. Uh, sorry, uh, that first I had nothing to do with Connacht, that he comes from southeastern Ulster, and that his, his um, therefore his relationship is entirely with uh, Laos and Armagh. Um, all this other evidence would contradict that. So, this Abbot Arnulf of Lagny, uh, uh, it, it appears um, that he uh, uh, commissioned the copying of ancient lives uh, at Peron and Lagny of Saint Fursa. Um, now, it's been said that nothing has, is known about this Arnulf other than that he died in 1106. Um, a little digging says otherwise. Arnulf was actually the son of the Count of Champagne and brother to Saint Thibaud, whose relics he brought with him when he became abbot of Lagny around 1094. He was, he was uh, his, um, he, his first cousin was the Pope. And so when he, uh, when the church reformers wanted to uh, reform Lagny, uh, bring Lagny in line with uh, uh, 12th century church reform, Gregorian reform, he wrote to his, his, his cousin, uh, the Pope, and said, listen, we're a special case here. Uh, we're, a, we're, a, we're a Celtic foundation from a long time ago, and you know, reform does not apply to us. And the letter survives, both that letter and the letter back from, from his uh, cousin, the Pope, survives. And, 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 and the, the, the letter from the Pope is kind of funny. Of course, of course, you're an entirely special case. Don't you worry about it. I'll talk to the Archbishop of Paris. It's fine. It'll all be fine. Um, love, your cousin. Um, it, it's kind of funny. Uh, I thought, hmm, maybe there is a letter. And so I went rooting and, 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 and found uh, found the letters, which normally things don't work like that. You know, you think maybe there's a letter from the Pope that survives. Uh, in, in, this on, in this one case, it did. Um, it's kind of informative. So here's Arnold. He's very, very well connected. And he is trying to uh, bolster his, uh, uh, his abbey of Lagny to say that this is, a, we're a special case. We're a Celtic monastery. We don't need 12th century reform, goodbye. Um, and of course, one of the things that he does is uh, have, uh, uh, have a root um, in, the, uh, in the book boxes, in his scriptorium, in his library, uh, in, in La Atlani, uh, to look for the oldest surviving lives of St. Fursa, their patron, uh, in order to, to, to have it beautifully copied and sent uh, to all of the um, the, the monasteries of the, uh, the congregation of Fursa in northeastern France, including um, uh, Peron and including um, other, other monasteries as well, um, to, to, to um, bolster their case. Um, yeah, so Arnold's letter and prologue describe how, yes, he commissioned a monk named Serlo and uh, uh, another one called Robert of Argentou <coughs> to collate this second life of St. Fursa. I should say, the first life of St. Fursa isn't really a so. <coughs> it's purely about the, the dream vision that Fursa has. <coughs> of heaven and hell, with a little bit of biographical detail tacked on to the beginning and the end. But the first life isn't really, isn't really a, 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 a vita as such. The second life is. So we're getting kind of a narrow time frame. So from 1094 to 1106, in which the second life of St. Fursa was produced. And this is where the problem lies, because people say, well, what's the point of, who cares? 
um, about a, an early 12th century uh, life of um, a 7th century Irish saint. But Arnold's prologue is very informative about the how the text was compiled. Firstly, he addresses it to the abbot of the clerics of Peron, who he says in a slightly reproachful tone, has set him the difficult task of commissioning this new life of their mutual founder, Saint Fausa. Secondly, he makes reference to how the abbot of Peron had labored to provide him uh, with the most ancient works collected from the most places in various different languages, all of which documents Peron had furnished uh, Arnulf with to bind together, to blend together in one volume. And hyperbole aside, and on face value, this prologue seems to suggest that the sources for the Vita Secunda of Fursa were supplied by the clerics of Peron to those of Lagny from as antique and authentic sources as possible. Concerning the different languages of <laughs> these sources, there is an important clue within the text. In chapter eight, the compilers estimate that the child is baptized for Seus. And in Latin it says, according to our best interpretation of the <laughs> Irish language, um, which, you know, it's kind of, they, they're really, they're really, really doing their best here. But um, it, 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 that, that is very telling. Um, so, so it seems to imply that they were struggling with at least one exemplar in Irish. And this accords with Colgan's criticism that the Vita Secunda gives the names of places in Ireland in a very uncouth orthography. By comparison with the first life of St. Fursa, written soon after his death, the Vita Secunda seems often to be dismissed as, as, as written late and of doubtful veracity, especially concerning Fursa's origins in Ireland. But the prologue of Abbot Arnulf of Lagny appears to contradict this implying that, true or false, Fursa's early life in Ireland, recounted in the Vita Secunda and not in the Vita Prima, came from an earlier source rather than the imagination of a late 11th century French cleric. So, why have I inflicted on you guys so microscopic a provenance for the transmission of the texts of Fursa's and Meldon's Vitae? Well, I wanted to demonstrate that both Desme, Desme's life of Fursa and Colgan's life are perhaps more authoritative as witnesses to the lives of Fursa and Meldon than has been assumed before now, and perhaps more revealing of information about these saints' time in Morshola by Loch Corrib. It's also important to say that while Desme's life of Fursa and first and second life are similar. They are sufficiently unalike to suggest that they are drawn from different sources. So they're not copies of each other. So then how does this change how we read the text? In particular, the early section set in Ireland. Uh, and I think a, a, a brief description of this early section is, is, is useful. Story opens with Finlu, a king in Munster, who has a son called Finton. Another king, Brainan, is king in Maumar Hevna in Louth. King Brainan has two younger brothers, Aidfind and Faradok. Aidfind has a daughter, Gelgesh. And a comparison here with the secular genealogy, genealogies is interesting. In the pedigree of the men of Brefn, um, uh, Brian, ancestor of the Ivruin, has four sons, Faradach, Diachla, Aidfin, and Brainan. Um, three of these sons may correspond with Aidfin, uh, Fursa's grandfather, and Fursa's maternal uncles, uh, Brainan and Faradach. Um, Aidfin is sometimes described as king of Brefna part of Connacht at this time. Now, interestingly, the secular genealogies show that these brothers were cousins of Aid Makechach Pirm Karna, whose father, Echach, was the brother of Brian. And as we talked about earlier, Aid Makechach Pirm Karna, king of Connacht, 
from about 560 to 577 gave in Chiquin and Anna down to St. Brendan. So this potentially places the characters in Fursus Vita Secunda in a more secure historical uh, setting than, than believed before now. And actually, the inclusion in the Vita Secunda of, of Fursa uh, of this material, of this genealogical material, apparently predates the great Irish genealogical text. So that's kind of interesting and it's kind of corroborative. So in the story, Fursa's uh, father, Finton, goes to serve Brainan as a warrior and thence to the court of Aethfind, where he and Gelgesh fall in love and marry in secret. Finding her pregnant, her father, Aethfind, is enraged and condemns her to be burned, despite King Brainan's best efforts to restrain Aethfind. But God, ensuring that the unborn baby Fursa should be saved, causes a spring to rise from the ground and extinguish the fire. Whereupon Aethfind, thwarted, banished both his daughter and her man. Finson flees with his wife to the island cell of his relative, St. Brendan, who shelters them and who baptizes the baby Fursa uh, when he's born. While Brendan has three foundations at Clonfert, Anadan, and Inchiquin, the description of the island in the Carib suggests that Inchiquin is the most likely location. Now, at this point, um, it's kind of uh, tempting to throw your hands up and, and find the introduction of St. Brenda, Brendan into the life of St. Fursa as, you know, beyond unlikely. But there might be a, a metaphorical rationale to this. Finton's relationship with St. Brendan suggests that Finton's father, Finlu, was chief of the Altri of the monster area around Tralee and progenitor of Brendan. And a law tract, a 16th century Brehan law tract in Trinity College, Dublin, preserves a story which might have some resonance about the migration of monster people to Connacht. It asks, when did the Kiri first come into Connacht? Not difficult, in the time of oh, yeah. age, Sonas Eka in Connacht. There follows a story about how Kerbera, son of Connu, a leader of the expelled monster folk, negotiated for Connacht land from Aid Macecher, the kind of tale which might provide a context for the story of how Fursa's father Finton is in Connacht. Yeah, yeah. The most recent editor of the Vita Prima of Fursa, that's the, 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 the story which is wholly concerned about the, oh, no. uh, his vision, his dream vision, estimates that Fursa was probably born around 600, but this doesn't accord oh, no. with the chronology of the Vita Secunda, oh. in which Fursa uh, becomes the pupil of St. Brendan, uh, yeah. who, according to the annals, died around 577. Never, never. suggests that Fursa graduated to become the student of Brendan's successor, Meldon uh. Quinn and from an early age uh, began to perform miracles. The jealousy of his fellow island monks, however, caused Fursa to desire his own cell. So with the license of Brendan, he founded his own church nearby. So how does this compare with physical and historical evidence? The monastery of Kelersa lies, you know, I could have taken a, a closer picture. That's that's good. Good. Right. Uh, lies on the mainland opposite Inchiquin, two miles east of Loch Carib. It consists now of a mainly late medieval church in the north corner of an irregular shaped graveyard. But there are clues to its earlier phases. An unmortared traviate or lintelled doorway appears to survive from a pre-10th century phase of this church. There's the, a church whose much smaller size can still be discerned in the west gable wall that you can see there. Oh, that's a, the gable that's, that's um, centered on this doorway is, is 
a kind of a shadow of the, the, the earlier phase of, of the church. So the jams of this door inclined inward as they rise, and this is an architectural characteristic intended to harmonize with the batter or the lean in a surrounding wall. That's an indicator of age as well. Parts two of a monastic enclosure wall survive. No, not Kilkuna, survive in the base of the graveyard boundary. So though the Ordnance Survey recorded this church uh, to be Calursa in the townland of Orr, in his, um, uh, the resultant map produced by the Ordnance Survey uh, misnamed it Kildare Church, by which name it's still called in the um, archeological inventory. It's, it's weird how uh, churches can get lost in plain sight by being renamed. Uh, and it's, it's kind of hard to argue with that. You have to kind of show by um, stages what, what might have happened, what happened. It got mi mi misnamed. Interestingly, the townland eastward of Killers is called Ard Finton. Uh, and uh, uh, John O'Donovan for the uh, Ordnance Survey recorded in the early 19th century that oral tradition at that time maintained that the ring fort in this townland of Ard Finton was where the father lived of one Fursa McFinton. So there's quite a lot of um, circumstantial evidence uh, from, from, from dis, uh, different disparate uh, disciplines um, supporting uh, the notion that that first uh, uh, came from, from, from this district. Meanwhile, in the story, in the Vita Secunda, Fursa's fame had reached Gelgesh's father, Eidfind, who, with his brothers, King Brainan and Ferdach, resolved to visit him, presumably at Kilersa. And after throwing himself on the ground and strewing dust on his head, Eidfind is forgiven by his grandson and reconciled with his, with his daughter, uh, Gelgesh. It appears also to have been at Kilersa that Fursa experienced his visions in which St. Bjorn and his dead teacher Meldon appear with the angels to aid him. But once again, it seems to be a recurring problem for Fursa, he begins to have problems among his fellow monks. And the Vita Prima very coyly remarks, after 10 years of traveling around Ireland, proclaiming the word of God to all without obsequiousness, and perceiving that the spirit of many stimulated by envy were provoked against him. Fursa left Ireland um, with his two brothers, Foylan and Ulton. Well, you know, to misquote Oscar Wilde, you know, to lose one monastery may be regarded as a misfortune. To lose both looks like carelessness. So while the English writer, uh, uh, English historian, the Anglo-Saxon historian Bede explained that Fursa's purpose was to spend his life as a pilgrim for love of our Lord and to go wherever he found an opening. There is an enigmatic line in the late 11th century account of the Septs of the O'Flaherty in the territory of Muinsher Morica, including uh, Morshola, which therefore includes Kilersa. And this tract is just, it's the tract that keeps on giving because it, 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 it's just it's such a mine of information for this, for this territory. The tract records E. Uh, Girin and E. Govoin are Eranachs of Calersa, together with their townlands, and Fursa cursed E. Govoin. What are we to make of this? Irish saints' curses have been characterized as public and formal punishment especially against those who destroy or covet church property. Irish saints' curses are very, are very much a, a subject that, that, that uh, is studied, especially abroad um, in, in France and in America. And an American scholar called Lisa Bittell has uh, written quite a lot about Irish saints' curses and, and has discussed how they may have been recorded to have been read aloud as a warning to later audiences. So is what we see in the Winter Morica text such a warning? And what trespass against the saint did the Igovoin commit? 
as the hereditary tenants of the church lands of Kedassa. Chapter three of the life of St. Meldon, uh, which section Calgan trans transcribed from Desme might give us a clue. Here the congregation are described as raging men, violently angry, and to have lapsed from Fursus teaching back into the abandoned learning of Ireland. Fursa hurriedly gathered his brothers, Boylan and Alton, and monks still loyal to him, and the relics of many saints, including Meldon and Bjorn, and they all fled eventually to arrive in East Anglia. So this doesn't sound like measured pilgrimage, yet it accords with the entry in the Winter Morica tract, recording for posterity the cursing of the Igovorn by the saint. And first, his departure from Ireland had impact in Morshola beyond Kilersa. Uh, there's a fragmentary life of Saint Kuana, uh, uh, which includes a discussion uh, among this saint's congregation on the reason for Fursa's leave taking. Um, this is uh, Kilkuna, uh, one of the, the most gorgeous little um, early monasteries. Uh, which has um, uh, uh, the stump of a, a very, very lovely round tower in it. Kuna has been described as the brother and successor of Mokuda, who founded Lismore Abbey in Munster, but he was expelled from Lismore and sent into the land of the enemies, that is Connacht. Mm -hmm. And like the biblical figure Habakkuk, he flies through the air on a large flat stone until he reaches a spot not far from Loch Corrib, where he founds his church of Kilcuna, where today there lies a small monastic boundary enclosing a graveyard, a ruined church, and as I said, the stump of a very fine round tower. In the life, Kuana cures the thirst of his monks by raising a miraculous spring from the dry ground near his cell. And in fact, as we know, uh, about a mile away, lies the well called Davakuana, or Dawakuna, Dawakuna. Which is the bell, yeah. well. Um, one day, a portent appeared, according to the Vita, a great bell hovering in the air overhead without a hand to hold it. Kuana tells his monks that the Holy Fursa has sent the bell to bless him, because Fursa himself, now in Peron in Gaul, cannot be with them in person. The congregation ask, why did Fursa abandon Ireland? And Kuna appears to sidestep the question somewhat by telling the story of how Fursa swapped illnesses with his friend, uh, Saint uh, Menon of Kilmainham, his own uh, flux of dysentery in exchange for the reptile living inside uh, uh, Menon. This tale appears also in the martyrology of Angus. But here, Fursa swaps his headache, or perhaps piles, <laughs> instead of dysentery. This is quite funny, you know, you think of these things as being quite private. And uh, here's the martyrology of Angus uh, talking about, you know, quite lively. So the martyrology explains that every morning Fursa had to eat three bits of bacon in order to abate the reptile's violence, <laughs> for which apparent greed he is censured by the bishop of a far city, described by Desmond as the Pope in Rome. However much this story does not answer the question of why Fursa abandoned Ireland, it shows a link between Fursa and Kuna, and it, it, it shows how um, uh, Things like, you know, the comment in the Dictionary of Irish Saints saying, you know, why, why is there a saint's life of Kuna? And, and, you know, what's in the life of Kuna doesn't amount to anything, or doesn't mean anything, or, or, or has no relevance. Actually, when you put it in context, it's amazing how much it, it does refer to what else is going on in, in this area at the same time. So there does appear to have been a specific ecclesiastical circle on the eastern banks of Loch Corrib in the second half of the sixth century, 
and the first half of the seventh, consisting of Brendan, Meldon, Fursa, and Kuna, and maybe more. So why there, and why then? There is a possible clue. Fursa has been linked with St. Patrick in some of the literature, and indeed, the relic of Patrick is sometimes included with those of Meldon and Bjorn, but Fursa brings away from Ireland with him, eventually to be enshrined at Peron. In fact, there's a, a, one of the later Irish abbots of Peron writes a very, very famous verse um, in Latin on the, the, uh, the relic of St. Patrick supposedly buried by Fursa in Peron. While Fursa's ownership of a relic of Patrick might link him to Ulster and Armagh, the seventh century Bishop Pyrrhicon uh, related how Patrick journeyed down into Connacht as far south as his foundation of Donna Patrick in Morshola. Uh, this is within the, sort of the wider um, area of, of uh, again, the royal landscape of Lochkine and, and Lochma. So Patrick journeyed down as far as, as Donna Patrick in, in Morshola before turning northward again. Donna Patrick lies within a very few miles of Loch Kine, Nochma, Hedford, Calursa, Inchiquin, and Kilcuna. So perhaps this place represented a border between the Christianity brought by Patrick and existing paganism, and perhaps the ecclesiastical cluster of the century following Patrick on eastern Loch Carib represents a, a mission of sorts, largely originating from Munster, to convert from where Patrick left off in Carnac. So while the German scholar Stephanie Hammond, among others, have assumed that Fursa followed the rule of Patrick, it's equally possible that Fursa, Meldon, and Kuna followed the rule of their spiritual mentor, Brendan, which only in later centuries in Carnac gave, gave way to the supremacy of Patrick and Armagh. Thank you. Yeah, we all nearly fell in at that point. <laughs> My son, yeah, fell in. He, he, he makes a habit of that. Not anymore, because he's 13 now, but he, 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 he did fall quite regularly into holy wells, which I think is only a good thing. Um, um, I, I like that particular picture. I don't know if I have any more. No, I'm back to the lake again. So, yep. So, thank you very much for listening. <laughs> um, I think um, looking at things in, in context and looking at clusters of saints is, 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 is a, a useful thing to do rather than looking at individuals and only looking at texts. Um, and it's more fun, you know, to, to go visit things and, and uh, see what's on the ground. Thank you very much. That was fascinating. Um, Right. So, um, is there a community to bring to you well in the church? Is it church? Is it church? Right. I mean, it's not surprising. It, it, you know, you get across the Where you have a person in a way you have 
Oh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> <Do> that. <laughs> they'd be very pleased. Yeah, I mean, there's, a, there's a, in, 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 there are also smaller villages um, near Paran where, um, um, which, which gained Irish abbots from um, Irish pilgrims, clerics coming from Ireland and, and, and going to join the congregation at, at Paran um, and, and gaining their own uh, church. Um, quite quite a few, um, and there was a cachet to uh, to being at, at that time to being an Irish cleric uh, abroad. Um, some of the descriptions are, are, are quite funny. You know, for for every local warlord, it was a good thing to have an Irish saint um, that you uh, you were the patron of an Irish saint. Even if he did, you know, call your wife a whore or, you know, <laughs> did something completely, you know, socially unacceptable. This is because it's wife number four or number five or number six. Or um, uh, there's almost a sense of, oh, yeah, well, that's what you'd expect him to say. He's doing his job. Um, you know, they came with, with, with a very stringent and penitential uh, view of Christianity, which for a time, um, had this cachet uh, in, in Northeast in France and in, in France Island. Yeah. 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 No, other than um, in Chiquin being, being the island of the sons of Sewer Queen. Um, nothing, yeah, nothing seems to have been given. Yet. No. But having said that, I wouldn't be surprised to turn up. Um, I mean, I don't know of a, a holy well on in Chiquin, but there has to be one. Um, and that, you know, what kind, what name it would have, I'm not sure. Um, that's something. To yeah. Yes. Yes. Great. Yeah. Because when I was doing my thesis, you know, if I, if I wanted to look at any of this stuff, there's 220 volumes of the Patrologia Latina, um, which had really bad indexes. Um, so if you, you know, if you wanted to look at any any kind of patristic uh, Latin text or Greek text or any kind of um, uh, any of the um, the, the correspondence of, of the papacy, anything like that, it was a real slog. Whereas now it's they're all digitized. There's a uh, Patrologia Latina, you know, dot com. Cool and. Uh, 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 you can search it very well, mm. um, so that's amazing. That's mm. that's really quite extraordinary. Mm. Um, I published uh, an article in Peritzia on the Second Life of Saint Persa uh, in in Peritzia, which volume? Oh, no, it, it's it, it's it's. Probably nine, probably 2020. It might be 2019. Um, the journal Parizia. Um, it's called a reappraisal of the Vita Secunda Saint Persa. Um, 
but not n not the um, material about um, uh, St. Melden or St. Kuna. Um, I think the St. Kuna material is, is the, it, it, the, the little life, you know, it's so embedded in, in the location and with the archaeology. Um, I'm not sure, I, I would love to publish that. Um, and I'm not sure how to do it, you know. Is it, do you concentrate on, on the textual side or the archaeological side of what you do? But first, uh, because, because it was a, um, such a text-based um, piece of research, yeah, I'll publish it. Thank you very much, Jeff, for your book. Thank you. Thank you.